My presentation today is a synopsis of my dissertation and focuses on the fieldwork I did primarily in Sri Lanka and also in Kerala and Tamil Nadu. There are three distinctive temples that were founded in the Gampala period in Sri Lanka, that is from 1341 to 1410, and they were modified in the Kandy period, which is 1473 to 1815. And these three temples are located in the central highlands of Sri Lanka in the Udunora electorate of the Kandy district. Popularly known as the last monumental temples of the island, they are the Ambaka Devale, which is a Hindu temple dedicated to the war god Skanda, and Gadaladenya and Lankatilika royal temples, which are primarily Buddhist, but also contain certain Hindu and tutelary gods within them. In terms of their art, architecture, and iconographic programs, none of the three temples fit into a traditional style, such as the temples we see in the early capitals of Sri Lanka, such as Anuradhapura or Polonarua, or those in and around Kandy. I propose that the cosmopolitan time period of Gampola and Kangdi kingdoms, where religious syncretism led to the merging of Buddhist and Hindu ideas, resulted in creating these unusual temples, with art and architecture which really doesn't fit into an exclusively Hindu or Buddhist category. To emphasize my point, I address the historical developments surrounding these three temples and provide some examples from their distinctive roofs, royal patronage and temple art, along with some of the temple pillars and their wood and stone carvings. Ambaka Devale is a Hindu temple that is primarily dedicated to God Skanda, who is popularly known as Katharagamu Devyo in Sri Lanka. Devale refers to a house of God usually placed in a subsidiary location to the main image house of the Buddha. In terms of religious, archaeological and art historical points of view, the Ambaka Devale is a conundrum that is fraught with dualities. Although the Devale is dedicated to a Hindu Brahmanical god who assumes a significant position as one of the four guardian gods of the island, a small shrine room consecrated to the Buddha the most consequential figure within the Buddhist pantheon is annexed to the Devale on the side. And you can see it in the screen right here. The founding legend of Ambekka Devale is shrouded in mythology and folklore and dates to the early Gampula period, while the architecture and the extensive wood carvings indicate a later date in the Kandy period. The construction of Gadaladenya and Lankatilika temples do not fit the traditional pattern of royal patron providing support for lo local temples. Both temples were constructed by non-royal patrons, indicating the weakening power of the Gampala kings. The Gadaladenya temple was constructed by a South Indian architect named Ganesh Prachari under the advice of a prominent Buddhist monk Silavamsa Dharma Kirti. Silavamsa Thera received his education from Chola Thera and later spent time in Dhyanakataka Amaravati. The Lanka Tilaka inscription identifies Sapati Raya, a South Indian, as its chief architect under the patronage of Minister Sena Lankadikara, who was a descendant of a South Indian merchant family. Although he had assimilated into the local culture, they still identified with their South Indian roots. This historical background offers a plausible explanation to the Hindu characteristics we see in Gadaladenya and Lankatilika temples. The syncretism seen in the religious front, where Hindu gods merged into the Buddhist pantheon, is visually articulated in the juxtaposition of elements of Hindu temple architecture with Buddhist temples of Gampala. The deities placed within the shrines also indicate the changes that were taking place in the Buddhist pantheon during this time. 
The subsidiary shrine within the main Kandaladeniya temple was dedicated to God Upulvan, although today it is used as a shrine for God Vishnu. Therefore, between the Gampala and Kandy periods, an ideological shift had taken place that merged Upulvan with Vishnu. A similar placement can be noted with the architecture of Lankatilaka when considering the inclusion of subsidiary shrines around the central Buddhist Vihara. Similarly, a shrine for God Saman is included in the Lankatilaka temple, which indicates that between the said time period, the deified form of Bodhisattva Samantabhadra has been accepted into the pantheon and consequently into the Gampula and Kandy periods. The architecture of all three temples presents several similarities and differences with traditional Dravidian temple architecture in their overall compositions. Although I use standard Dravida architectural terminology to identify these comparative architectural components in each temple, I also stress here that these three temples in Sri Lanka are not copies of Dravida or Kerala Hindu temples. According to Branfoot, although, quote, Tamil Dravida language, unquote, has been used to demarcate the various architectural forms in the Gampula period, the temples do not adhere to the form and style of the 13th century Hindu temples in South India. He attributes this difference to the differing practices of Buddhism, where the temples were created as an architectural space specifically to accommodate Buddhist worshippers and to facilitate Buddhist ritual. While they share many elements with temples in South India, the Sri Lankan tem temples stand on their own, with individual characteristics that specifically accommodate Buddhist worship, acknowledge local Buddhist gods, as well as Hindu Brahmanical gods. Between some of the colonnades are heads of the Kadladenya temple, on the other hand, does not depict as much variation in depth and instead, the colonists that create the illusion of fake doorways protrude slightly from the surface of the wall. Face between the colonists that protrude significantly in Lankatilaka, the Gadaladenya temple, and you can see that in the slide here. The Gadaladenya temple, however, seems to have multi tiered roofs that gradually slopes with clay tiles added over its stone dome at a later time. According to these earliest photos of the Gadaladinya temple by Henry Cave in 1908, Cave states that Candians fervently added sloping roofs that peaked at the top to Candian Devales and temples. Cave suggests that, the, that this addition of tiered roofs may have been an attempt to make the buildings look more Candian in style. Perhaps this might be seen as an attempt to cover the domes inspired by the South Indian architecture. The patronage given by Candian kings to Gampola period temples is remarkable when observing various royal grants and inscriptions. According to oral history, King Rajadi Rajasingha has granted land to Ambakkadevale in the Kandy period. The Lanka Tilaka copper plate inscription contain details about the grants by King Kirtisri Rajasingha and his brother Rajadi Rajasingha. Perhaps the most intriguing factor here is that these two kings were not Singhala Buddhist kings, but that they were Hindu Saivite Nayakas from Madurai, South India. The paintings in Lanka Tilaka and Gadalatinya from the 18th century attest to the Buddhist revival of the Kandy period and to the Nayaka presence and artistic exchanges with Madurai. Both Gadaladenya and Lankatilaka depict a myriad of figures from the Hindu pantheon and Mahayana Buddhism juxtaposed with local Kandyan paintings. The selection of various deities and bodhisattvas indicate the extent to which Hinduism and Buddhism has synchronized within these Buddhist temples. The devotees who enter the image houses would be visually engaged with the sculptures and paintings 
and be able to identify at least the most important Hindu gods such as Vishnu and Ganesha while worshipping the central Buddha. With Devales being articulated into the architecture of both temples during the Gampala period, the Kandy period inclusion of Hindu and Mahayana figures further emphasized the religious syncretism that was being experienced in Kandy and in its peripheral temples. While the Hindu and local tutelary gods were in close proximity within the niches of the walls of Lanka Tilaka and the adjacent shrine of Gadaladenya, they seem to have entered the main Buddha shrine in the Kandy period. The gods and celestial beings are placed above the central Buddha in the Makara Thurana in direct view of the worshippers who enter the shrine. Flanked by two standing Buddhas on either side, the central Buddhas in both temples are seated in a meditative posture under a Makara Thurana that depicts Ramanika gods such as Saka, Vishnu and Ganesha. According to Holt, Makara Thurana at Gadaladenya include Brahmanika gods such as Brahma, Saka, Suyama and Santusita as well as Buddhist bodhisattvas such as Natha and Maitreya. The paintings in the Buddhist shrine at Ambekka Devale follows the same juxtaposition of sculpture and paintings of a Kandyan Vihara. But as its stylistic variation indicates, the paintings and sculptures exhibit characteristics of the 19th century. The form of the pillars in Ambakka Devale, along with the two stone pillars of the Gadaladenya temple porch, tell an interesting story of the amalgamation of Hindu South Indian, Gampola, and Kandyan architecture. The Gadaladenya temple porch has two stone pillars on a stone base that is decorated with two stone elephants and a set of steps that are also carved with dancing figures at their base and two yalis as handrails. While the carvings on the steps and the pillars have been discussed by several scholars, what I question is the form, iconography and the possible provenance of these two unusual composite columns. The bottom, top and centre of each pillar are square while two octagonal portions form the rest of the pillars. On two sides of each pillar are two octagonal shafts that are connected to each central pillar. All four small pillars rest on the heads of stone lions that are topped with another lion who sits on a lotus pedestal. However, these two pillars are, are not identical. Despite being composite pillars that look similar at first glance, the decorative designs and the overall compositions differ significantly. As Holt notes, the right column indicates Hindu iconography, while the left column depicts an iconic Buddhist iconography. The right column has prominent Hindu iconography such as Shiva Nataraja and Krishna, while the left column has lotus motifs and foliage designs. Although the main column on the left does not depict anthropomorphic figures, rows of discs with dancing figures connect the two subsidiary columns to the central column. The dancers mirror the ones that are carved underneath the main steps between the yalis and around the stone base of the entrance porch. The lines on the two pillars consist of different decorative designs on their mains and the capitals of the four subsidiary columns are also not, not identical. While the conflation of Hindu and Pan-Asian motifs provide a view into the dual nature of the two columns, I raise several questions regarding their provenance and development in Gampula. Due to the absence of similar composite columns extant in Sri Lankan temples, I turned to South India to look for possible prototypes. As pointed out to me by Anila Verghese, the Virupaksha temple in Hampi has columns that are very similar in form to those of Gadaladenya. 
The side aisles of the Maharanga Mandapa at Virupaksha Temple consist of composite pillars with detached columns, a seated lion base, sharp pushpa portika or pekada motifs, prominent nagabandha motifs, bulbous lotus pushpa portikas of the detached pillars, and lotus medallions carved on the pillars. Although the composition of the central pillar differs from the alternating square octagon square form, the iconography and the detached pillars show a strong visual similarity with the Gadaladinya pillars. The yalis and the miniature carvings on the base of the mandapa also reinforce this comparative visual analysis. The wooden columns of the Kendi period are significantly standardized and can be seen in the pillared hallway of the Ambakka Devale. To address the form and composition of these pillars, I once again turn to South India. The Meenakshi Shiva temple in Madurai consists of the Thousand Pillared Hall, also known as the Meenakshi Nayakar Mandapam, built in 1559 by Arinatha Mudlia, the Prime Minister to Viswantha Nayakar, from 1559 to 1600. He is the first Nayakar ruler in Madurai. Among the multitude of single composite and sculptural pillars, the northwestern corner of the hall consists of a cluster of columns that are very similar in form to the pillars in Ambake. The pillars are carved in stone, but follow the square octagonal square octagonal square form with decorative carvings on the center square. The Nagabandha is prominently carved in the stone pillars in Madurai, while in the wooden pillars in Ambake are carved within a cube, representing more of a foliage pattern. The center square of the stone column consists of a mostly repetitive floral design that is also seen in Ambake Devali pillars, indicating the possibility of their mass production within one workshop. There are 514 different wood carvings of various mythical and anthropomorphic figures and lotus medallions in the Ambaki pillared hallway. The wood carvings, which are neither Hindu nor Buddhist in context, are often seen as prototypes of Sri Lankan art by prominent local scholars. The Usamba Kunyara, popularly known in Singhala as Rushaba Kunyara, is one such carving. In this carving, the bull and the elephant share one head. The tusks of the elephant are also the horns of the bull. There is no record of this motif appearing in wood or stone elsewhere in the country prior to the Ambaka Devali carving. Perhaps we can turn towards South Indian iconography for comparisons given that one of the most popular Usaba Kunyara in India is located in the balustrade of the Airavatesvara temple in Darusuram, Tamil Nadu, that is dated to the Chola period, 10th century CE. Discussing the history of mythical animal motifs in India, authors Ayer and Nadu mentioned that the Perunda motif, which is also seen among the Ambake carvings, came to Sri Lanka through South India, specifically from Vijayanagara. Ayer mentions a human figure with a double bird head that came to Sri Lanka from India, although the sources or the locations of where this motif can be seen are not mentioned. Naidu traces the history of Gandha Perunda from Taxila to Vijayanagara and Ceylon. However, he does not mention the sources that indicate how the motif transferred to Ceylon. Other examples of mythical creatures of Ambake such as Makara, Kirti Mukha and Vyala, as well as the highly idealized lion that are rendered in stone, can be seen in various sites prior to the Gampola period, such as in Anuradhapura, Pulamnaru and Yapahua kingdoms. Therefore, I refrain from stating that iconography only transferred from India to Sri Lanka in one direction. The possibility I propose is the presence of migrant artisans, the Viswakarmas who travelled between the two regions, who may have been privy to the carvings of various regions, creating 
pan South Asian motifs. In conclusion, the three monumental temples of Gampola indicate a convergence of Buddhism and Hinduism and a Buddhist identity that is less capricious and more inclusive and fluid than contemporary Sri Lankan Buddhist practice. Even the socially prolific and dynamic time period of when these temples were built and renovated, their art and architecture necessitates a more complex analysis based on historical context with an inquiry that ostensibly looks towards both inter and intra-regional activity and exchange of art and architecture, particularly with South India.